Hi, I'm Nick Rains from Leica Academy Australia. In this video, I'd like to share with you my four favourite features of the brand new Leica M11. So I've been very lucky to have access to this brand new camera for a few weeks now and I've been out and about on the east coast of Australia for a little while now dodging the rather wet weather we've been having so I've managed to shoot a few pictures in my usual style which is basically travel and documentary so I'll share with you a few of those and then we'll actually have a look at the camera itself and I'll talk you through a few of the features which have really made a difference to my work. Okay, back to the camera. Well, this is the new M11 and I've got it sitting here next to an M9, my original M that I have been shooting with for quite a long time. It's pretty much retired now because we've got this new one, but you can see they're so similar. I think the M11 is a smidgen thinner than the M9. It's really hard to tell, but otherwise the entire form factor is the same. So let's have a quick close up of the M11. I think it's pretty obvious from this view that the form factor of this camera has changed hardly one tiny bit in the years since this style of camera was first brought to the market, which I believe would be 1954. Um, on the top, there is one new button, which is a programmable function button, but everything else is pretty much identical to the previous cameras. Uh, you've got the ISO dial here, just like in the M10. Um, and everything else is as you would expect it to be. If I just turn it on and put the menus up on the screen, you'll see that the menus are very, very consistent with the other Leica cameras. Um, the SL2, the SL2S, the Q2 all have this exact same menu layout, which makes it very familiar. So there's really no surprises here at all. It's super clean, super efficient, and anybody who picks one of these up will feel right at home. There's 40, there's more than 40 new features and benefits in this camera. There are other videos, I'm sure we'll go through all of those, but I've just picked four which have been very beneficial to me in the sort of work I do. Now, the first one, of course, is the image resolution. I mean, just think about what this camera is giving you. It's 60 megapixels. That's just incredible in a camera of this size. And combined with the best glass that money can buy, I mean, really, it's just astonishing what has been achieved here. What does 60 megapixels look like? I make my prints at approximately 240 pixels per inch. That's for the bigger prints. Smaller prints, sometimes 360, but bigger prints, 240. And if you do the math on that, you'll realize that without any interpolation at all, you can create a print that's a meter by about 0.6 meters. Now that is a pretty hefty print. Now I can't show you that here in my little studio. So I'm just gonna go upstairs into my house and I'm gonna show you a print on the wall. This is a 36 by 24 inch print. And in metric terms, that's 900 high by 600 wide. The M11 in comparison would do a print natively without any interpolation at all the size of the actual frame itself, which is a, just over a meter high. So no scaling up, no trickery, straight off the sensor, 60 megapixels gives you a print that big. So that's a pretty respectable size print. And in fact, it's probably bigger than most people would ever want to hang on their wall. The next feature on my list is dynamic range. And I would argue that you can never have too much dynamic range. At the end of the day, you're trying to capture as much data as possible from the brightest highlights to the darkest shadows. And the ability to then post-process that 
and create an image which fits neatly onto a print which can only really display eight, maybe nine stops at dynamic range. That is the key to good post processing. So having a really good starting point is very important. Now here's a couple of images that just show you how deep the shadows can be on an image like on, a, on an image and still have a lot of recoverable detail because it's not about the amount of dynamic range so much as the quality of the data within that dynamic range. So here's a picture shooting straight into the sun. This is about minus two exposure based on the meters guess. I didn't want to blow the sun out too much. And I think you'll agree that the rest of the picture has pretty much gone into silhouette. Looking at this image now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that there's nothing left in there. But let me just show you what happens if I open up this image by going into Lightroom and cranking up the exposure by five stops. Look what you were missing. You can see there's a fisherman down on the bottom edge of the picture. There's a lady in the middle there having a picnic and you can see all of this grass area having uh, showing incredible detail. And that is good quality data. It's not all smudgy and horrible. That's what high quality dynamic range gives you. Now here's another example of much the same sort of thing. Straight into the sun, mid, almost middle of the day. Lot of deep black shadow, but you've still got the sky and the area around the sun at the top of the frame there, still correctly exposed. And this is exposed as per the meter. So in Lightroom, if I crank up this image to plus five stops in exposure, just look how much quality information is revealed on the underside of that tree. What was a complete silhouette is revealed to have an enormous amount of shadow detail, but it just goes to show just how much information is recorded in those shadows and you don't even know it's there. That's what really good dynamic range gives you. Number three on my list is the ability to do really long exposures. And I don't mean just 30 seconds like most cameras can do. This one doesn't even do 30 minutes. It does 60 minutes in one exposure and it even has a genuine time T setting on it for time, which means that it starts when you press the shutter button and then it closes off the exposure when you press the shutter button again. Very, very useful. Now, I don't do one hour exposures. I, one of these days I should really try it, but I do do a lot of long exposures in daylight using very strong ND filters. This image here is a 120 second exposure of uh, Brisbane over the river. And you can see how you get that typical effect of the water where the reflections of the buildings become kind of consolidated into mirror images. Whereas normally when the water is just rippling around um, in the wind, you just see a faint shimmer. But as it accumulates the image over that length of time, you get this lovely soft water effect and a much more effective reflection of the buildings. Plus, if you look carefully, you'll see that the clouds have moved during these two minute, this two minute exposure. And it gives a certain uh, dynamic nature to the picture. Now, the last feature that I found quite surprisingly useful, and it was something I didn't notice when I first got the camera, was only after a while I realized what I was looking at. When I use the camera, uh, SL2, any camera, I use live view a lot, either in the electronic viewfinder at add on for the M11, or of course in the viewfinder of the SL2 or the Q2. When I'm shooting manually, as in manual focus, when you focus, you can magnify that view and critically focus. But if you magnify a lot and it magnifies to 100%, it also magnifies the movement of the camera. It gives you camera shake. It's heavily magnified by that magnification to focus. So it's actually quite tricky to hold it still enough to focus, particularly when you're hand holding. Obviously on a tripod, it's fine. It's no big deal at all. But if for some reason you are hand holding, that can be a bit of a problem. The M11 stabilizes the magnified view because it's only a small part of the sensor. The ability for the software in the camera to stabilize that image means it will move the image it's magnifying around on the sensor to compensate for any wobble. And it gives you this lovely static image that you can focus very, very easily with much, much easier when it's shimmering around. So here's an example. This is me with the M11 and you can see how steady the magnified view is. And then I've gone to the SL2 and I've switched off its own uh, sensor stabilizer because that obviously won't give you a, <laughs> a good comparison. And this is the best I can do with the SL2 with the same lens. And you can just see how much more sort of shimmery it is. 
I find this astonishingly useful, but I tend to use it more with the EVF. But even then, it's absolutely superb. So that's a really nice add on to the camera's features. All right, well, those four features I found astonishingly useful. And of course, the 60 megapixel part of the equation is the big deal. It enables me to do colossal prints with a very, very compact camera. My entire landscape photography kit can effectively fit in the bag about this big. One body, let's say three lenses, electronic viewfinder, a couple of spare batteries, absolutely sensational. So for me, the M11 is an enormous step forward. And I think you'll find the same if you get one yourselves.